Night gathers, and now our podcast begins. It shall not end until we're done talking. We are the princes that were promised. Welcome to the princes that were promised. It's me, it's Shawnee Wan, and joining me as always, the warden of Long Island, supreme leader of all spoilers, it's John. John, Game of Thrones is over. That's it. It's done. Doesn't feel right. What does it feel like? Does it feel like betrayal? Does it feel like... I don't like know. I, I just... Very numb. Yeah. I I, uh, I, I think this is going to be a common thing we're going to say, and what we will be saying in future podcasts, but I was just thinking of the whole entire season. I said to myself, these guys didn't even need a full 10 seasons. I mean, 10 episodes this year. If they just would have had two more episodes, you have an extra episode for the wall night, and then an extra episode between five and six, in the middle of five and six, you could have gone around and explained some things. You could have actually written some things better, instead of just having all this stuff happen, like, off-screen. Jamie's arrest, off-screen. Like, why did he even arrest him? Well, I think Jamie's whole entire narrative in season eight doesn't it starts making a lot of sense, but right. then I feel like anytime these characters are going not coast to coast, further than that, you know, they're going from King's Landing to Winterfell and back, you know, in a matter of an episode. And this we can go back to Daenerys on Dragonstone getting beyond the wall, fairly far beyond the wall, in what was that, twenty minutes of, of TV right. time? There's problems anytime the characters are journeying that far. Maybe they do it in a way that you don't really notice how far it is that they're traveling, but at the same time... I, I think these past couple of seasons, we've really noticed it, though. Right. The bigger problem with that... Well, there's, there's two bigger problems with it. The, the one being, in a way, it breaks the fourth wall. Sort of the way when... I don't want to jump too far all over the place, but when Euron looks at the, directly at the camera and he says, I killed Jamie Lannister. When that happens, that's kind of like breaking the fourth wall, but... When you express how far a distance one castle is from another, or point A to point B, in, in any world that you're building, on TV, in a book, comic book, a movie, when you state what the distance is, that's the distance. And then when you set the quickest way to travel that would be by a horse, right? There's no cars, there's no planes. You have a dragon, maybe that travels a little bit quicker. Three days as a raven flies. Whatever it is that you use to measure time and distance then when you betray that, even if it's something that you, you know, most people may not notice because they're not thinking how quick can a raven fly, how far is Winterfell from King's Landing actually, but you're still breaking that rule that you already set up and it may not be noticeable for the viewer, but it does hit you on a subconscious level that they're breaking their own rules in a world that they built and established. And I think the bigger problem is that they didn't know how to get to these points and that's Mm -hmm. why there's been so much crazy travel in these last two seasons. It speaks to why George is having such a problem finishing these books. Yeah, maybe he he has too many characters. He went in too many different directions. But the mirror needs not. The reason that he had so much trouble finishing A Dance with Dragons is getting these characters in front of Daenerys so that they can move on from there. But he has to do it in a logical way. He can't illogically bring these characters to a certain place if they're coming from somewhere else because there has to be logic and it has to be the logic that you establish from the get-go. And uh, Benioff and Weiss did that, though they're adapting that logic off George's George's story, but they, they broke all those rules. It just makes me think that a lot of what happened in season seven, in season eight, are not necessarily things that are going to happen in George's story. I think they were just trying to come up with the quickest way to hit these plot points and then get these characters where they're supposed to be. What do you think? It's very possible because George comes out and says, when he mentions all these characters' names, and notice how he said, you know, he mentioned Young Griff as Aegon the Sixth. Yeah. So that tells me one of two things. First, the one I'm hoping for 
is if John is actually is in the egg and he's egg in the seventh, or two, can't understand why they would do it, but who knows? Did D and D say to hell with John's real name? We're just going to give give him the name Egan as Rhaegar's son Egan. I don't. I'm going to lean more towards one. I'm still giving them the benefit of the doubt that his name is Egan the seventh. Yeah, the only thing with that, and, and we may have had this conversation before, but Rhaegar's children's names have been mentioned in the TV show, right? Yes, they mentioned. They have mentioned Egan. The one who got killed by the by the mountain, right? And Ray and Rayella, Rainies, Rainies. Yeah, I always get that. It's just my thing. It, it wouldn't have made a difference at all if they named him Jaharis or. Yeah, as it turns out, the way they shit on his character all, all season this season, it, it, it doesn't make a difference what his name was. His name could have been uh, Jim Bob Cruder. Yeah, <laughs> Jim, yeah. you're Jim Bob Targaryen. <laughs> yeah, you're the king all along. You're Jim Bob Targaryen. You know, I think it's funny. How you're upset about Jamie's arc, and I'm upset with John's arc of the season. I mean, he really did nothing, and maybe uh, until really the, the last episode. And even then, and he sits around. She's my queen. Yeah, I need all these pills to convince me how bad she is. With the normal John Snow, would actually would have been taking care of this already. Denny, like they just very poor writing. I don't know if it was very poor writing for all the characters. I can't say it was poor writing for Jamie. His story, sure, but. I thought his dialogue was well done, but John's was, mm-hmm. other than that one monologue, beginning of episode four, his dialogue was, was an afterthought. It's like John wasn't a character this season. I don't know what that means for the books either, because no explanation for how he came back from the dead. It's just got to be accepted that he can come back from the dead. It's just magic. And ultimately, no real reason for him to come back from the dead. I mean, he, he won the Battle of the Bastards, sure, but does he make that big of a difference where that battle wouldn't have been won without him? Well, in, in the books, it's probably not him there. It's probably more the more or less Stannis. I just I, I just have to go back to the books. He's got to have he's got to do something with the Night's King, and I do believe he is the one who's going to kill Daenerys. The parts of the ending for the characters. And I'm not talking about the way they got there, but their ultimate fate, i.e., Bran's the king, John kills Daenerys. Tyrion is a hand. I have to believe that those parts of the story are what George told them. They just mm-hmm. had no real good idea how to get there. I feel like we can bash Benioff and Weiss all night, but maybe it's a good place to start and get it out of the way. Have you read about Disney Lucasfilm guys being on set for season eight? No. Okay. Granted, it was on Reddit, but I, I've read posts saying that there were Disney executives on set of season eight. And my thoughts are a lot of the poor writing and poor execution of season eight has to do with their Star Wars trilogy, which will start in 2022. 2022, 24, 26 is going to be their Star Wars trilogy, which I think was originally Ryan Johnson's trilogy. And I think all the negative backlash for for The Last Jedi gave them cold feet with Ryan Johnson's trilogy so they're going to go with Benioff and Weiss. I feel like they thought that they were a better choice, a surer thing, because of how good Game of Thrones was. Yeah, but now... Uh, well, that uh, joke's on them now, but do you think that's something that could have to do with how bad the writing was for this season and how rushed everything felt? Well, I definitely heard some people say that they were already one foot away from Game of Thrones, already one foot into Star Wars already, caring more about Star Wars and stuff like that. Yeah. That their mindset... I'm not saying that they were already like writing... But th- that their mindset was already, well, let's just get this done. Come on, come on, shoot, come on, let's get it done. We're, 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 we're on the Star Wars. It was over a year, it was over, over a year ago. Maybe shortly after season seven, the news broke that they were getting a trilogy. I don't know if they would have to pitch an idea for a trilogy or it would have to be that. It'd have to be that. I don't think Kathleen Kennedy is coming up with ideas for Star Wars trilogies. As we know, other than Kathleen Kennedy, there's no one running a show over there. It's all pick up the ball and go and give it to the next guy. Unlike Marvel Studios, Kevin Feige has the overall plan. He's in charge of things. He gives the directors certain freedoms and he lets the directors and writers tell their story. If things need to be included or taken out, it's because of an overall picture. But there's no one like that with Star Wars. So I have to think that they were maybe invited in to talk about one, but 
the idea for whatever their trilogy is, it'd have to be theirs, I would think. So in relation to Game of Thrones, it probably was something that they've been working on side by side with season eight for Game of Thrones. Unless you think maybe season eight was written before season seven aired or shortly after. The focus wasn't there though. It felt like such an afterthought. It felt like, let's just get it done with. Make sure we have those shocks and, and a few surprises and let, let's get this over and done with. You know, the more I thought about it, you're right. They didn't need a 10 episode season eight to make this work. And had they known, they might've been better off just not including the White Walkers at all. So I mentioned that one of the reasons why they went so vanilla with the White Walkers is because of the prequel show. That they didn't want to give away anything because they're saying that after the prequel show. I don't know if I can buy that. Unless maybe they really thought they had something. You know, maybe they thought they had an entertaining episode and people would be okay with that. I understand their decision to not make the White Walkers a season-long arc and to have what happens with Daenerys and Cersei. I understand a lot of their decisions, but none of them were executed well. I think upon initial airing, I watched it first and then you texted me afterwards and you did like it better than I did. I don't think that I hated it. I just think that it was a period on a dull and meandering season that shouldn't have been worked out the way it was. So Mm -hmm. what, what what were the things that you liked about? And what was it called? The Iron Throne, right? The Iron Throne, yeah. I thought I thought for sure it'd be a dream of spring. Yeah, that's what I thought. So, or I thought it'd be maybe a time for wolves, because yeah, yeah, because the problem with the dream for spring is it wasn't really winter anywhere. Yeah, anywhere. <laughs> but conveniently, here here's a complaint. Explain this to me, please. In episode five, the bells when Daenerys makes her attack and all, looks like it's fairly sunny there, right? If I'm not mistaken. At King's Landing. Yes, yes. Okay. And then we go to the beginning of the uh, last episode here. And, like, you know, the first, you know, it kind of looks like it's cloudy, maybe a little ashy. But when John goes out to see Daenerys, it's like a full blown blizzard. Is it possible that was ash? No, nah, that was snow. That was, that was completely snow. I guess they were traveling right in front of the uh, cold front. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Jamie had the wind to his back. That's how he traveled so fast. All right. Well, things that you liked. Let's get the stuff we liked out of the way. Where would you rank this episode in the season? What's your order? Individual episodes, best to worst. Best to worst. Uh, two, six, one, uh, five. Wow. Four, three. Okay. Wow. I would go two, one, six, three, five, four. Two one six, three five four. Four is far and away the worst episode of this series. Two is one of the best, but four is far and away for me the worst. All right, it's the second best episode of this season for you. Give me five things you liked about it. Five. Oh boy. <laughs> Try for three, and then if you keep going. <laughs> uh, Tyrion. Tyrion. Nice. Mm-hmm. I know many people didn't like it. I like the I love the ending montage. Yeah. I liked it a lot. I liked it too. You know, it would have been better if everything leading up to it was better. I actually liked the scene of Daenerys speaking to her. I mean, let's say it again. You go back to like after episode three, uh, Benioff was talking about how pretty much the Dothraki is gone. But like each episode, it seems like they're doubling in numbers, like they're gremlins or something. It's like uh, they're just they're like Agent Smiths in the Matrix. Like there's more yeah, if you need them, it, and if you don't need them, then they're not <laughs> they're not there. Then we just take some away, we add some in, you know. And, and even Unsullied, also, there seems like there should be, there's a lot more Unsullied than there should be after that big battle at the Long Night. Did he say that there was half? What did Grey Worm say in episode four? Did he say half the Unsullied are gone, or he said half? Then, I don't think they even mentioned the Dothraki. Well, because Benny of have no idea how many Dothraki are left. There's none left, and there's a few left, and then they get all the Dothraki in the world, and then, yeah, <laughs> you know, then they all get killed during the battle, and then... But, yeah, you're right. Daenerys' speech... Listen, I, I think Amelia Clark's acting... I think her and Peter Dinklage will both win quite a few awards for this season, and I think 
both their performances, and I'm just saying performances, were the highlights of season eight. I would agree. Dinklage was awesome. In a lot of ways, this may be his best his best performance this season as a whole. Um, but it may also be that everything else was so bad that it just stands out more. All right, so that that's three things, right? The ending montage, mm-hmm. uh, Dinklage. What was the first thing? Um, bu- 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 bu. I said Dinklage, I think. Oh, and, Tyrion, and then and then Daenerys. That's three: Tyrion ending montage, Daenerys speech. Um, John killing Daenerys just so all you Danny fans take it. That's four. Now, was it that he killed Daenerys, or did you like the actual the scene? A little bit of both. Yeah, I did like the scene, even though it was kind of cliche that he's kissing her and stabs her. Well, I like the part where they needed another scene. They needed a scene. They needed a shot with John and Danny, where Danny says, "I want. I'm gonna send word for your sisters to come up." Okay. So then when he seen, so then when he sees Tyrion, and Tyrion says, "What about your sisters?" Then he's gonna like it, it shows him more emotionally. I think instead of just tr- I think it would work better the scene with Tyrion, and then she, then she says, "I want your sisters to come up, right?" Because then you already know that Tyrion's warning him that yeah, six of one, half dozen of another. You're right. But when when she said that, you know, no turning back on John. When point for John was when she when he said, "Well, what about everyone else?" And she said, "They don't get a choice." I mean, that's a full bloom. Tyrant right there. Now that's Emperor Palpatine stuff right there. Yeah. You know, that that's that's Adolf Hitler right there. That that was the point right there, like, yep, yeah, I have to do this. I don't know why it took so long for him to do it to realize that how bad of a person she became. Well I think yeah, I feel like once she started burning the women and the children, he should have I mean, can you argue that it's his sense of loyalty, that it's his Yeah. His his honor that he I guess so. I mean, that's the only argument. But it is poetic that he kills her. And we've talked about him killing her. We both thought that he was going to kill her. To make light bringer. Right. Um, and I've seen some people theorizing that that him killing her does create light bringer in that she would have, I guess, brought darkness to the realm. It's yeah. a, It's a stretch. Um. See, I could just buy it a little more if John defeats the Knights King, because then John's status is he's ice and fire. He's a song of ice and fire. He, he kills the ice villain and the fire villain. It just makes more poetic sense to do that. Yeah, and it gives John, especially since you're gonna shit all over this whole entire thing of oh, Brand's out to tell tell Sam. Oh, we gotta tell him right away that you know who his parents are, and then all of a sudden we're just gonna be like, up oh, that that means nothing. So it gives John a purpose. I guess it's kind of poetic. Ned travels south to fight a war with Robert to win the throne. And he sees Robert's okay with killing babies, you know, killing the Targaryen babies. And it leads to a falling out with Robert. But he's still dutiful. He's still loyal to his king. John travels south with Daenerys. And he sees that Daenerys is okay with killing a lot more children. And he kills her, right? You, you kind of see the the uh, what Ned couldn't do, John could do. Mm-hmm. But there was very little mention of Ned Stark at all this season, so it makes me think that maybe Benioff and Weiss didn't even notice that. Probably not. Yeah. <laughs> There's elements to that last episode that I do like a lot, and I think not that they're obvious when you think about the books, but they make a lot of sense when you think about the books and the stories of these characters. I says for, can you come up with a fifth thing that you like? I guess. Well, again, the cinematography was good and the music was good. Oh, I love the music at the end. And I believe that's out now that soundtrack, if you have Apple music or whatever. And I I keep meaning to get it, you know, or at least I got it. Yeah. I picked it up. You listen to it. Yeah. Much like why I can't rewatch the episode. I just, I can't bring myself to do it yet. That one shot of Daenerys and Drogon stripped. Oh my God. Awesome. 
All right, so let's start with Brand then, as far as our problems. It seems likely, unless George I'm alters gonna his I'm going to have to assume. Yeah, I'm going to have to assume he has to. I mean, you, how, how, you can't diverge off that, right? No. Well, I mean, you can, but it didn't make sense. I feel like they wanted us guessing who was going to be the king or queen until the very last second. Yeah, they, they kind of tease Sansa, and then Sansa just turns away and like looks at, you know... Um, Yara. Yeah. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, the man who has so many stories, Bran the Broken. Like, well, we're just going to call him Bran the Broken now all of a sudden. Like, his name's Bran the Broken. Right. It's not very nice, but okay. Bran doesn't really care about anything, so that's okay. But then he's like, why do you think I came down here all this time for? <laughs> it's like, wink, wink. All right, so that, it feels like that's supposed to be like, the key scene for this entire series, right? Where they figure out the future of Westeros and move on from there. Well, I guess that Spash guy was right about the uh, the trial, because it was a, a trial of sorts. Who, with the new Prince of Dorne? No, the the guy. Who, oh, who oh, 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 uh, yeah, Freaky Doctor. He was right about that. Yeah, and I guess I guess the reason it was so top secret is it was that was the key scene. We just thought it was from other reasons than actually where it was, you know, it was for, you know, if you look at the you know, Selly's view of a treason, we thought it was just treason for something else. We thought it was, you know, treason that, you know, Tyrion betrayed right. and went on Cersei's side. So we were, wrong on, we were wrong on that. Yeah, I bought into that theory up until the first episode and then I wasn't, I wasn't so much into it. Because then it seemed obvious that it was Daenerys that was going to turn. It could have worked so much better if the Unsullied weren't so unbelievable. Right? Was like, did Grey Worm rule the realm at that point in time? Yeah, like all of a sudden they're in charge of the city. Like, you want to talk about a freaking dick? Oh my god! You're like, what? Like, what do you? What do you just leave Grey Worm? What do you? Your queen's dead. I don't know. I get you know. I guess I understand that they arrest John, but they're killing all these Lannister prisoners. But it's like, how they even know John did? I guess John was so armed because we, it's off scene. You don't even see Ugh, anything. They're so lazy. They showed nothing. Our fans had the most vivid imaginations that we just left it up to them to imagine why John was imprisoned. Like, you may as well just not air the final season. Let us imagine what the ending is. I've said, exclude the White Walkers altogether, you know, and then make Mance Raider and the Wildings. Maybe they find some giants. Make that what the White Walkers were. Because then it's not unbelievable that they get defeated in one battle. You know, you got to add a little juice to them to make them that big of a threat that they need Daenerys. When Viserion gets killed and, and turned into a white dragon, I feel like it would work better if he didn't. Then the battle at Winterfell, it'd be more believable that they win that in one episode. Mm-hmm. And then you have three dragons going down the King's Landing. You have some more stakes because he could be the first dragon that dies. And then you go into that last battle with two dragons. I don't know. But to make that last episode more believable, if Yara had declared for Daenerys, she should, she is- she should be there with the Iron Fleet. Like, make it believable that Jon's really in trouble. Mm-hmm. right? Make it like we're on the verge of war again. And I think that's the idea with Tyrion's speech is he's supposed to be avoiding another another all-out war. Because the North, the Vale, the Riverlands, they come down because Jon's in prison for killing Daenerys. But Yara is already sworn to Daenerys. She believes in Daenerys, so she comes, you know, she comes for help. And um you, know, you have other factions involved, other noble families involved, maybe the Baratheons. Gendry was made a lord by Daenerys, so maybe he's there to defend Daenerys. So you have all these sides about to go to war again, all of them with King's Landing under siege. And then there's stakes in that speech, but to have it just be Grey Worm and the growing and shrinking number of Unsullied as it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And it's it's frustrating. That scene could have worked so much better. And Tyrion's monologue about stories, like I, I get that, but it, it doesn't work here because... You know, who's had a better story than Bran the Broken? Like, everybody's had a better story. Yeah. You, you have. 
Yeah, you have Sansa has maybe Arya has John John has who's the heir to the throne, and he's not even at this freaking meeting. Edmure Edmure has a better story than Bran. <laughs> <laughs> that was funny. Oh, that was great. I loved it. When he got up, I thought he was gonna, you know, I I did think he was gonna nominate himself, but he did. I was like, that's <laughs> awesome, awesome. Yeah, but it's like Tyrion is a prisoner, and we're all listening to the, to the prisoner. Right. Right. The differences between the Tyrion TV show, Tyrion book. I mean, he's a lot darker in the book. We've talked about that. And not that he's okay with what Daenerys did. But I see him being more complacent to what she does. I think if the book has a similar scene like that, I don't see Tyrion in irons. Right? I don't see him a prisoner. You, you would think he'd be a little more cutting not to get caught and be arrested like that. But the same thing goes for Varys. You're not going to see Varys get caught like that, you know. No. Scheming. So, like, what's the word? Uh, uh, Against their character. So, like, what's the word? Like, scheming out in the open so evidently that he's doing things behind uh, Danny's back. Okay, yeah, I, I, I know what you're saying. I got you. Well, he's going to be sneaky about it. He's not going to be like... <laughs> Let me just write this letter. Yeah. Yeah, that was very unvarious like but... Again, they just wanted to get to point B. Bran could be a good king, and I imagine George will have it make a lot more sense when he... When and if he becomes a king. All right, can I ask a question now, then? Can I ask this question to you? Go ahead. Did you get anything out of that that Bran is a villain? No. No. Are you buying... Uh, uh, yeah, a little bit. A little bit. All right, break it down. What, what are you thinking? What's the thought? Well, he's always had to have known he was going to be in that position. So he let all those people... He let all the people die at the long night. He let Theon Greyjoy died the long night. You know, he knew Arya was going to, you know, <laughs> Arya is going to be there. Right. All right. But whatever. Let's just go with the flow, I guess. Right. You know, instead of the end, say, listen, at the end, hold back. Don't worry. We're going to be fine. And then he goes off to like, you know, whatever he was doing during that battle. He knows it's going to happen in King's Landing. He doesn't warn like John. Listen, John, you can't go down there. She's going to do all this and that. So then he also has to know that John's going to kill her. So he already knows he's got one thread of the iron thrown out of the way. And now, when they go on to the whole entire agreement that John has to take the black again, because if they don't want another fight between the Northmen and the, and the Unsullied and another war, like, they see that... What's his name? Uh, Grey Dick over there, <laughs> is leave is leaving. They could have just said, listen, John, John, okay, come back. You're not, don't worry about it. They're going, right, fake like they're going to die. Fake like you're traveling that way, and yeah. all right, he's gone. Yeah, at the island, basically, the Unsullied should die. The island north, there's a, this, what is there, like a flesh-eating disease over there or something, like butterflies and shit? Yeah, it's, uh... It, it, they should technically be dead over there, it's, so what's the point? It's a theory, basically. Every bit of outsiders that come to the island of Nath all die of an illness. And uh, mm -hmm. the theory is that it's, there's so many butterflies on the island that the people that grew up there, that natives to, uh, to Nath, they're immune to it because of evolution or whatever. So yeah, once the Unsullied get there, they should die. They're, yeah, they're, I don't know if in Game of Thrones world, but, you know, in a song well, of obviously, the obviously, you know. yeah, obviously not. <laughs> yeah. But after they leave, they should be like, all right, John, let's, you know, you don't have to go to the north. You can do whatever you want to do. So it's almost as if Bran, by sending an agreed John to go to the north, giving up all his titles, all, you know, he'd father no children, that's relinquishing John as a threat to his throne. I can buy that. The only reason I don't is, uh, and it's not information that's shared, which is, is frustrating. Because, right. but you what know, was the sense that of telling him that what he was, if we're not going to, you know, if we're not even going to like let him have the choice? If if I had to make the connection, and I don't think it's a good connection to the reason why he told him, 
Right, so going back to the end of episode one. Did they know that it was going to piss off Danny? That they knew that would be a trigger point for Danny? Yes. That's I, probably I, part I, of the I, reason right there. Yeah, I, I think so. But here's here's a, and I, it, it's an interview with Isaac Hempstead, right? And I, I texted you the article, but I think it was like right before an episode aired or something. Basically what Isaac Hempstead Wright was saying, Ari Brand's powers, as it was explained to him. And I got to go back to see who explained it to him because I doubt it was Benny Hoffman Weiss because I don't think they understand a lot of what they're writing. But as he understands Brand's powers, Brand can go back in time and he can see anything. He has an archive of all of history available to him at any moment. He, like he doesn't, he doesn't know it all, but he can go back and he can see it all. As far as the future, he can't see that. What his powers with the future are is, for example, when Arya goes to see him in the Weirwood and he has the cat's paw dagger, he knows he has to give that to Arya. But he doesn't know why. He just mm-hmm. knows he has to for something that's going to happen. So when he's saying, we have to tell John, according to Isaac Hempstead Wright, it's not that he knows why they have to tell John, but he just knows that they have to tell John now. So he has, he can see everything in the past and know everything that happened in the past if he chooses to. And in the present, he knows when something happens or if something's about to happen that it's important for the future or has to happen for the future. If that's correct. And I mean, it's just going off Isaac Hempstead, right? It's not like George Martin pulled him aside and said, here's what Brand's powers are. Um, and it, it doesn't seem like Benny and Weiss really – know what brand's powers are but it's not but, the future that it can see so you know as it turns out it looks like he dicked a lot of people over you know and it looked like he caused a lot of unnecessary death mm-hmm. and uh you know when the night king here's here's an argument in, in favor of what you're saying the night king is coming to kill him why you know why does he need to kill him is it so he can warg bran and then he'd have that power to to see the entirety of the past you know like what power does knowing everything that happened in the past what does that power mean and i guess it means you can see things that happened right because history has a way of repeating itself so you can see things that happened and prevent them from happening again because you see the situation in which they happened um and i it's it's a metaphor i would think in in George's writing, at least. We don't have the ability to know exactly what happened in the past, but we go read books, we do research. We remember what happens now for the future so that we learn from our mistakes and we can prevent the wheel, so to speak. You know, we, we can break our own wheel. And uh, Danny wanted to break the wheel and in, in a lot of ways... She did, like she didn't, but she did by being that, that last straw, you know, being that, that last possible tyrant leader, Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then her death makes, makes Westeros different. And I got to say, I did like, you know, when Sam got up and said, let's let the, the small folk have a say and everybody laughed at him. I, I liked it for the comedy, but I also liked that they didn't jump to that. Like for a minute, I thought he was going to give this speech and everyone was going to be like, yes, you know, we'll start having, uh, we'll call it elections, you know, Mm -hmm. and they'll just make up democracy right there. I I like that they didn't go that far, but they took a step towards democracy. It was like lukewarm water. Yes. And along the lines of lukewarm water, it seems like they have a, a political system much like Naboo, (laughs) where, yo, Amidala was elected queen at what age 14 or whatever, Mm -hmm. you know, and then the next queen's elected. So it's, you're electing your king or queen. They have absolute power when they're king or queen, but it's, it's in a very early step towards democracy. I like that they didn't go all the way because that would be 
I mean, no more illogical than a lot of other, other choices they made this season. I, I, I want to comment because you just talked to Sam. I want to make sure I add this in. Uh, one of the things I definitely did not like about this episode, uh, Sam and John should have had a scene together. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, it, I just don't get how they didn't have a scene. A lot of this stuff, you know, they had more time. It would have made sense. But I don't know. I guess that oh. the scene, a scene of them at Winterfell, I guess, is that was their, that was their goodbye. Yeah, but yeah. I just think that, you know, he's going back to the wall. They should, that perfect moment for them to talk about it, you know, to have a, you know, another conversation. Um, I, another thing, uh, I mean, we, we, we brushed upon it before, but I want to get just your opinion on the length or a, more, more of an overall feeling of the, of the time jumps. You know, obviously the biggest one is after John kills Danny, there's a time jump. You know, how long do you think that time jump was? We're going to safely assume at least six weeks. I guess. I mean... Because Sansa and Arya are there with the Northern Army. They're not just there by themselves. They have the whole entire army with them. So it's going to take at least... I mean, technically speaking, from the books, it should take three months, about. You know, two and a half to three months. Well, that's, that's the only barometer we have. But keep in mind, the three months is for, you know, an entire retinue. You know, uh, a horse-drawn carriage. And one person... Could go a lot quicker, but if Sansa's traveling down, that's that's probably about right. You know, maybe they're, they're traveling at a quicker pace, uh, but you don't know. You, you know what I mean? You don't. You just jump from John doing that to right. Tyr- Tyrion waking up for trial. So the only clue that you have that there even is the a time jump is the beard, because mm-hmm. I mean Sansa's there. You know, you left her in the north, but at the same time, you've broken the wall to the point where travel from Winterfell to King's Landing is, you know, the, the blink of an eye. And what was Arya doing the whole time? Did Arya go back north or like wouldn't Arya if Arya was at King's Landing and John did that? Well, the only thing is John did tell her to go to the gate, so maybe she took that as to leave. So maybe she probably left. That I'm just assuming that. Did he say go to the gate and wait for yeah. me? Yeah. Mm-hmm. He, he said wait for me though, right? Yep. The Arya of Game of Thrones, right, that they've given us, especially over the last two seasons. She's not running back north to get Sansa. Like she's going to figure out a way to get Jon out. Furthermore, the Arya that they've given us for the last two seasons would be able to break Jon out. Am I am I wrong? No. That's the problem when you do certain things. You make characters being in a position of uh, invincibility, and then they don't use that invincibility when they actually should be using their invincibility. Yeah. <laughs> invincibility, I mean, that's it. You know, it's like, um, you know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the way they've been using it sometimes, it's almost kind of like, you know, it's, it's like Mario Brothers. There's certain points where she's got the star man, and she's just, you know, yeah, can't be affected, but then there's a certain points where she's back to, like, mini Mario. <laughs> Yeah, right? And I guess that was a point where she was mini Mario. All right. Well, let's talk about John then. Are, are you okay with his fate? Um, look, before we get into John, I think maybe we'll get you know, I was thinking maybe we should get that into the last three. Okay. State. Okay. I, I, I just wanted to reinstate something I said for the Battle of the Bells, or what, the, the Bells, what do you want to call it? The Battle of the Bells. The Bells. Right. <sighs> I'm going to include John in this because it's, it's amazing how much shit he gets for killing Danny. Although he just saved thousands of more lives by doing it. Right. He saved so many people. He saved so many more lives by doing it. Danny would have kept on killing people and slaughtering people. If they didn't, if they did not bow to her. Yes. You can make the argument and I'll 110% agree that the way it was written for the heel turn was poor. The way it was so abrupt was poor, mm-hmm. and they, they did it just for shock value. But please stop saying it's not going to happen to books. She's going to be a villain in the books. Yes. She is going to commit mass murder in the books. Yes. And stop defending her. I'm sick and tired. I'm a Danny apologist. So you're in favor. So you want to follow someone who's killed so many people. 
you like villains that that you like you like Emperor Palpatine that you like Saruman, Sauron. And it's cool to like villains, right? No, there's nothing wrong with that, but like, but don't act, but don't act as if like you're not into villains. But I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna back Danny because you know, I feel sorry for a character. D and D betrayed her character. They didn't betray no. her character. They, well, they they did a little bit. Go ahead, finish what you're saying. I'll tell you how they did a little bit, but not the way you're talking, not the way that they're talking about. It just goes back to the speed. You can make the argument that there's no way it's going to be that, like, flick of the switch. I get it. If you want to say, but she's going to be a villain. She's this, she's going to bring all kinds. I mean, these, dino, these dinosaurs, Jesus Christ, John. This <laughs> drag. <laughs> she's got dinosaurs, damn it. It's a raptor. she got a raptor. <laughs> <laughs> these, there's no way these dragons, I mean, if you really look back at hindsight, this really should have caught. There's no way these dragons are, are a good thing. No, no, definitely not. Definitely not. A lot of the things that she did were not good things. Even the stuff she did with the masters, right? The, the well, great masters. A, right, that's what Tyrion said. She killed all these people. And although they were bad people, we cheered her and got her more power. Right? She showed no mercy to any of them. Instead of like maybe just killing like two of the three main guys, she kills all of them. Or imprisoning them or, you know, allowing justice Mm -hmm. and it's it's funny and i don't know if i don't know if it's funny but and i don't know if it's bad writing but if you remember that episode with whoever that free man was that she put on her small council uh, if you will when she was queen in marine and then that free man killed a master i think who was imprisoned Mm -hmm. so then she killed him because it was justice do you remember that episode yeah, yeah. But she does the same stuff. You know, like, she's she goes and kills the, the great masters. Like, what's good for everyone else isn't necessarily good for her. And that speaks to what the Targaryens are, essentially. And what I've been thinking about in regards to Daenerys, it's something that George said, uh, and maybe said it several times, dragons are essentially nuclear weapons. Mm-hmm. So if you think about the Targaryens and the dragons and George's theme, at least, which I I think comes across in Game of Thrones, the effects of war and the people that really suffer during war mm-hmm. are the small folk. Are, are right, and, and Davos brings that up again in this last episode. Like, you know, if we have war, you know what's going to happen. It's never going to end, mm-hmm. and there's no good results. Yeah. 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 Good job by Davos, except they didn't show us that they were at the point of war. The way that they set it up with just the Unsullied and then every other great house of Westeros down at King's Landing, it's like, all right, well, you know, it wouldn't be much of a war. Like, yeah, a Grey Worm would probably be able to kill John, but they wouldn't live if they did that. In regards to the dragons and the Targaryens, and I can't take ownership of this. It's just something I've been thinking of. I saw a video one time where... The YouTuber was saying, essentially, dragons are preventing Westeros from advancing. Right. Yeah, you, you mentioned that last week, how, like, every time, you know, you try to advance technology, these dragons come around, they just burn everything. Right. And the idea of the seasons being off and all that. So, for the Targaryens themselves, they can control dragons to a certain extent. The practice of incest to keep the bloodlines pure. For the most part, the Targaryens have the blonde hair, right? And the in the stories, the purple eyes. And I think it's a metaphor for the Aryan race and Nazi Germany. And looking at it objectionally, that that works. So it's not just the dragons that are preventing Westeros from moving forward. Advancing from their current feudal system with great lords, high lords, nobility, and and a king ruling over all of it. It's the idea of a race that's better than the rest of humanity and Westeros and Essos in, in the known world. So the idea of Aegon the Conqueror, he looked at, and just bear with me for a minute, Aegon the Conqueror, 
he looks at Westeros and the Seven Kingdoms and he looks at the constant warring and how the small folk are the ones that are, are hurt the most. So he wanted to unite the Seven Kingdoms under one realm. And that's what he did. But what's that Tom Zarek quote? Oh, is it my, my favorite quote you're talking about? That from Tom Zarek? Your favorite Tom Zarek quote. I love Tom Zarek. <laughs> Tom Zarek's great, dude. And he, I love Tom Zarek. They could have used him. <laughs> History is told by the ones who live. Yes. So Aegon the Conqueror, his story is told by Aegon the Conqueror. Because he won. And he lived. And the Targaryens ruled for hundreds of years. So I'm not saying that's not how it happened. What I am saying is maybe the Seven Kingdoms, yeah, they were constantly at war, but the reason they never moved on from that, the the reason they never at some point stopped warring with each other is because Aegon came over and he conquered the entire continent of Westeros and it's been presented as a good thing and maybe it was not a good thing. You know, whenever somebody be it a tyrant, be it somebody who means well and turns into a tyrant. Whenever somebody does something for the good that affects everyone, it becomes bad, right? And it's ultimately a power play for them. Like no man sets out to be king for good reasons. John doesn't want to be king. There's a reason for that. It's not that he's not even thinking about the power and and, and the glory that would go with being king. Daenerys wants to be queen. She says she wants to be queen so she can break the wheel, so she can make sure uh, she takes care of of the people who are being treated unfairly. But she wants to be queen. She wants to be the ruler. And it's one thing when she's in Essos, when she gets over to Westeros, when she gets to Winterfell, you see how Arya and Sansa react to the way she is and how power hungry she is and how it affects Everything about her character, just the possibility that is more difficult for her to be queen than she thought, that she's not being welcomed as a savior the way she was when she was traveling from slaver city to slaver city in Essos. People that want to be king or queen, it's not, it's not ever a noble reason. Stannis's argument, it's, I don't want to be king. I I have to be king for the good of the realm. It's like, dude, you don't. And we see what happens to Stannis. Anybody that sets out like that, they fail or they become a tyrant. But there's no there's no in between. You know, it's one thing if you're you're the heir and and then you're a good king, but what the message is about monarchy is that it's not it's not a system of rule, it's not a a it's not a system that that works. And it's the small folk that always suffer because of it no matter what. Aegon didn't conquer the Seven Kingdoms for the small folk. Aegon conquered the Seven Kingdoms for House Targaryen. Does that make him a bad guy? Maybe he wasn't a bad guy, but... You know, maybe the reason he did it weren't even bad reasons, but... They were vain reasons. He wanted to rule. And House Targaryen always thought of themselves as above the noble houses who themselves think they're above Mm -hmm. the small folk. And don't get me wrong. Like we live now in a, you know, in a, in a capitalistic society where there's no noble families, but the Koch brothers, you know, any of these ridiculously wealthy families that live in America, they do think they're better than, than you or I, and they're not, in many ways, but in a lot of ways, yeah, they are entitled and they have a better life than us and they can do more. They can affect more people. They can do good if they want to. They can do bad if they want to. It doesn't mean they're better than us, but it means that they're in a better position than us and, and probably always will be. So it's not that a democracy, it's not that capitalism, a free market, a republic, it's not that any of these things means that the small folk are in a better position. But the message is that in that system, in a monarchy, with noble high lords, that's not good for the small folk. 
to that end with House Targaryen, with Daenerys, yeah, she had to go. And I'm surprised that Drogon stuck around at the end. Well, it, it's uh, it's very funny you mentioned both Daenerys and Drogon. I'm just reading a theory right now that says that Drogon took Daenerys east to Essos and she he's going to drop her off near... Um, Don't say Cal Drogo. No, 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 okay. no. Where... I don't have it out with me right now where it said, but uh, where Kinvara was, and Kinvara is going to resurrect her. To what end? They're not doing any more Game of Thrones TV shows. <laughs> is she, she's going to come back? Yeah, she's going to come back with Drogon again to try to... <laughs> and um, and her, her new hand to the... Brain. Her new hand to the queen is going to be Catelyn Stark. You've seen those memes with Catelyn? Mother to two kings and a queen. Like, yeah, like, ugh. Dude, come on. Yeah, well, none of this shit would have happened if she wasn't so stupid. Yeah, she's the one who started everything, pretty much. Yeah. And it's not started like, well, it's better off for the... No, it's not better off for the realm. That all this shit happened. You wanted to talk about something before, John? Oh, God, I forgot now. Yeah. One thing, I, I wanted to mention another thing I didn't like, and this... I understand. There's two real quick things. I understand. First of all, I understand that there's, you know, it's movies, it's it's TV shows. You, you, you're you're always gonna have like things like this. So it, it sounds stupid and nitpick, but Tyrion goes in and finds Jamie and Cersei underneath all that rubble, like one, two, three. Oh look, there's his hand. Right. It right. just seems just way too. Just too convenient, you know? Like, I don't think they needed... Like, here's one thing. Like, how would he even know they were down there? Well, I, I think he knew they were down there because he, he was talking... They were, they were trying to get to that boat he was talking about. Right, but who, how, who's to say that he didn't look at the boat? He didn't see go there and say, oh, the boat's not here. Maybe where are they? It was just like, let me just go here first. They, maybe there are there all these bricks. It was it was good acting by Tyrion, but it was an unnecessary scene that could have been used for something that right. They didn't even have to show them there, though, Sean. No. If you want to make the the argument that that that's he just knew that's where they were and that's where they died, you don't have to lift up a brick and see their face. You still could have had him start like you know, uh, bellowing in tears and 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 being and being upset. They would have saved You'd still. They would have saved two million dollars. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but, but have you seen the memes? Here's one thing we have to mention is the memes. The memes for season eight are awesome. Oh, uh, it listen. It's the memes nonstop. almost the memes almost make up for it. <laughs> There's that one meme where it says, You mean to tell me that Jamie and Stressy would still be alive if there were ten feet. Right. 10 feet Thirty feet to the left, behind. they would have lived. <laughs> they would have lived. Because right behind it, there's no rubble. Wrong place, wrong time. I don't know, man. The whole thing with Jamie and Tyrion, like the decisions they made prior to Cersei's death, they had to know that Cersei was going to die. So then at the last minute, at the 11th hour, for them to be angry at Daenerys or to run from Winterfell to King's Landing to, to be with her, more lapses of, of common sense in the storytelling. All right, I, I mean, unless you got something else you want to talk about, maybe, uh, maybe you should touch on John a little bit. I don't know why they had to make the whole thing like he has to go serve in the Night's Watch. And then I saw somebody write something that there was no more Night's Watch. They were just sending him north because they knew that's where he wanted to be. Well, he's he's not in the Night's Watch. He's, he's right. king beyond the wall. But I, I, don't door- think, I don't think he's even king beyond the wall. I just think he's, he's going to be a natural leader beyond the wall. I don't think they're going to do a king beyond the wall either. But Well, that's the same thing with, yeah. you know, as you just said, the, the, the dairy, we're, you're never going to see that. We just got to, like, okay, he's the king beyond the wall. He's going to be the new leader. So, king beyond the wall. Yeah. Which I kind of like. But I don't like that he was sent there. And I don't like that it's his family that sent him there. And I feel like, you know, she would have been such a dangerous queen. What he did, he had to do. I would have liked it better if they were... They even offered him 
I, I wanted to say the Iron Throne, if they offered him the crown, if they offered him the rule and he said, I don't want it. And then he, much like in the leak, I think said he it's a self-imposed exile. He chose mm-hmm. to go north. I would have liked that better mm-hmm. than everybody who knew what he yeah, did well, and who kinda... applauded what he did send him there as punishment. Even though it's not really it, punishment. It kind of goes, not that I'm going back to, you know, hype it on the brand, that's the villain part, but it goes kind of goes back to that. It, it's giving John the option that, because he was the heir. By not, by making brand do making all these decisions, when we saw, what, 30 years prior, when the other king let Jane Lannister go free without, you know, who killed the king. Yeah. Now we're set, now we're punishing this guy to go up north again. It's making it sound like it's not his choice. It's making it sound like Brand doing it to get him out of the way. At least yeah. that's how I that's just how I see it. Yeah. No, I can understand interpreting that way. I, I think it's just bad writing though. You know, I, I don't think that I, I don't think that Brand is a, a bad guy, although I do like that it's possible open ended that he is. You know, I, I like I like thinking about it. You know, is he, isn't he? I like that some things are left open, such as that. Um, and it was rather uncomfortable the way that the other Starks, like when John kneeled before him, like that has something wrong with the whole thing. But I would have rather John chose his fate because he wanted to be with Ghost and Tormund, and he wanted to be one of the free folk. Mm-hmm. The free folk yeah, don't that, need that, that part. I yeah, that part I I like, and I know a lot of people are upset at that. And you know, listen. Well, we were too when we heard the leak. I think, right? When we, I, well, I think I just accepted it. I think I accept. Okay, he's not going to be king, but I'll take this over. You know, him dying. Yeah. Yeah. I know a lot of people have a problem with that John now. How John needs to die for what he did in that area. Give me a break. Now, come on. It's people like that who you know what they've been counting on him dying, and he hasn't died. So you know, up yours. Did you like Drogon burning the Iron Throne? I thought it was out of place. A little bit. Yeah. I understand, like, why okay, the Iron Throne was made by Aegon, and, you know, it's going to be destroyed by Drogon. I, I, I get that, but I thought it was just a little, I don't know, you know, like, tacky or something. I don't, I don't, not, not tacky, but... Uh, Convenient. I don't know. Yeah, like... Oh, on the nose. Yeah. We're not going to have him burn John, so we'll have him burn the Iron Throne. It would have made more sense if they explored the warging ability of John and Daenerys to a certain extent, you know, because there has to be some warging ability the Targaryens have in regards to the dragons. I I liked it, but it was too, again, too much of a leap and too on the nose with no explanation. Mm -hmm. Oh, here's a meme. When you realize Walder Frey was a more formidable villain than both the Night King and Cersei. <laughs> yeah, I saw that one. Oh, Jesus. Oh, dude, this this guy This got Arya in the aftermath of uh Danny Byrne in the city with all crap all over her. And then it's got uh Jack and Hagar. And he's like, if a girl has mesothelioma, a girl may be entitled to significant financial compensation. <laughs> Uh, love it. What were you asking? What, what did I think of? Uh, I was going to ask you, what did you think of, uh, before we get on to the end montage, I think we should, add, that we should talk about the um, the little council meeting with now Braun, who has all these titles, Davos, Samwell. I was okay with most of it. Um, Braun was shoehorned in there. Yeah. Uh, and Master Coin, it's like, yeah, he was a... You know, a soldier for hire. I wouldn't trust him. Definitely wouldn't trust him more than you trusted Littlefinger. And right, like I would make him maybe master of war or something. Right. Yeah, that would be more obvious. So, all right. So, master of ships was uh, Davos. Davos, and then Sam was Mace. Grand Maester, uh, Archmaester, Archmaester. Right. What was the Archmaester? I don't know. I don't know. Well, it's two posi- different positions. Archmaester can be a Grand Maester, but Archmaester generally stays at Old Town 
Oh, so he's the Grandmaster then. Yeah, Grandmaster is the title yeah. of, of the one. I think Archmaster is more like a a like a uh, a dean of a college, whereas Grandmaster, you know, he's the most powerful maester because he serves a small council. So Sam was Grandmaster. Brienne, I liked Brienne was uh, as a uh, Lord Commander of the King's Guard. Although, might have needed the scene of Sansa releasing her from her pledge, but you know we can yeah. just, we can just imagine that. Yeah, and then we have. Um, and it was just Bronn. Bronn was the last one. Well, they had uh, Podrick come in. Podrick, yeah, who's the uh, master of push, pushing the wheelchair? Yeah, you know, <laughs> you know, it's another funny meme I saw. It was a picture of Bronn, I think, and it was like. <laughs> It was like, like like a picture of Braun like being like like confused or something from from a prior season or something. It was kind of like you know like a a disturbing face a little bit. <laughs> it was and like when you realize that all the money you're gonna have to spend on ramps in King's Landing. <laughs> uh, it's true. You got to make it handicap accessible. Yeah, there had to be a, a better position to give Braun, and I don't know why. I mean, I get why I you Master put him on a small council be because he he, you know, he owes him for not killing them. But listen, I don't think Braun is playing that big of a role, and 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 he didn't do anything. Two seasons, he hasn't done anything. He's just a fan well, favorite, so they keep him yeah. around. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, a lot more stuff that doesn't make sense than that makes sense, but it wasn't. Yeah, that's like you know, although like I've enjoyed the episodes more since I've watched it. You know, the two things. That- there are just things that you just watch and you just like, okay, what about this? Why really like you do catch it. It's just, you just shake your head. <sighs> but the ending montage, I like a lot. Yeah. And I like that they ended it on John. Yeah. And what was I going to say also uh, with John? Take that Brian Silk. Yeah. Take that also. He killed Danny too. Can't wait to tweet on that. Well, Brian just had uh, his kidney removed. <laughs> So oh, that is true. Yeah, that is. True. I did see the picture. Yes, I did he, see the picture. Yes, he gets a little. Uh, he gets a little. He's a, he a little slack for two weeks. You he's gonna like come back for now. <laughs> he's gonna like Texas out of the blue. What happened? Did, did anyone know happened to Danny? Yeah. Oh, it's gonna be like the Giants game. Yeah, oh, I didn't see the finale. It was like, oh, I didn't see that. exactly. <laughs> what, what happened? <laughs> like, what were you doing in the hospital? I'm sure you're watching TV. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Classic. Before we do the, the ending arc, let's just go through the, any characters that not too long, but kind of compare it to if that's going to happen in the book. So starting with Bran, yeah, that's probably going to happen in the book. Mm-hmm. It will be a lot more logical and a lot more rewarding. John, what do you think? You think he ends up um, beyond the wall? Yeah, I guess. I would have to assume. Okay. I do also, and I think it makes a lot more sense. And I think there's a metaphor that Benny and Fulmice don't see and didn't elaborate on because they don't see it but the idea that john the idea that westeros is still a monarchy but taking a step towards a a republic or a democracy like i think it'll be a self-imposed exile if that's how it breaks down i don't think that they'll send him there but when he's beyond the wall they're free folk they don't bend the knee i think that the free folk in general the wildings are another metaphor for the future for democracy for society that elects their officials that chooses who leads them they don't kneel, and they, they choose who they, their leader is. They follow strength. So I think it's fitting that John goes there, especially since he's a Targaryen. And I talked at length about what the Targaryens represent. John being a Targaryen, but John doesn't deserve the fate of Daenerys. John has always, especially as a leader, he's, he's looked at the bigger picture, and he hasn't made choices for himself. He's made choices for whoever he was leading. And that's been evident in the show also. So I think John choosing to go north and choosing to be in a free society, I think that's very fitting. And I actually like that ending for him. I, I think George will do it better. But I do like that ending. Sansa's queen in the north. How do you feel about that, pal? Uh, you, you, you know what? Uh, You've known it was coming. <laughs> You've been saying it for years. I knew it was years. coming. Um, the fact that Bran became king actually lessens that shock value and that angerment. Because it's just, I'm, you know, with Bran being king, it's just like, really? All right. I'll take Sansa. I'll accept Sansa in the north. There must be a Stark or Winterfell. Not that that ended up meaning anything either, but... Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm okay with it. We figured it was going to happen. Uh, you know, as soon as she started saying that... And she, she's right. The north is a free region. 
unless Rickon is alive at the end of the books. That's the only dagger in this. You know what? I don't see why he wouldn't be. Do you think that's a Benioff and Weiss, possibly a Benioff and Weiss original now? 50-50. Okay. I, I can see it go both ways, you know. That's one of those things that, you know, definitely not something I'll bet on, you know what I'm saying? I'm not going to bet on something like that because it's, it's it's way too too much in the middle. Yeah. But I could see Rick being alive. I could see, I could see him being being killed at the end. Or not even at the end, and then, you know, the next couple chapters of the next book. <laughs> yeah. How about Arya's fate? Just going off and exploring. Yeah, I would say that, yep. Yeah. It's like, whatever, it's fine. Jamie and Cersei. Uh, they're both going to die. Uh, I just can't imagine that George is going to have them die by, by death by Brook Lane. Yeah, I don't think so either. But we've talked about Cersei and her taking young Griff's story to a certain extent. And I don't even want to get too deep into how that plays out, but Daenerys versus Cersei in the final half of the season, that's not playing out in the books, I don't think. Maybe, but I don't think so. I, I, I think Young Griff will, will, will take King's Landing mm-hmm. from Cersei. And maybe Cersei he keeps Cersei alive or Cersei becomes a wife for Young Griff. You know, maybe, maybe, but I don't see that being Cersei's fate. I, I think, I mean, Cersei's a huge character in these books, obviously, but I, I think that Lena Headey... And her representation of Cersei, I, I think that went more towards the Bronn Arya side of things, where she was able to make that character more than the character was based on. And Benioff and Weiss ran with it more than George will. But either way, yeah, she dies in the books, but not not that way. Mm-hmm. And Jamie also. Jamie will probably die in the books, but not that way. And maybe they do die together, but. Jamie's under the, under the impression that she's going to die. When we leave him in a dance with dragons, he's under the impression that Cersei's going to die because she writes to him saying there's a trial by combat and he crumples up the letter, throws it in the fire, and Brienne shows up and he follows her. So he's already he's already made that choice knowing that she's going to she could possibly die. He's not rushing to her aid. And furthermore with Jamie, then moving his story all out of whack is part what killed his character. He gets sent to the Riverlands and from there, he's going to see Lady Stoneheart. I ma- have to imagine from there, he'll head north if this if that's the case, if that's what happens. I don't see him going back to King's Landing and then going north and then back to King's Landing because that's a ridiculous amount of travel for one character. That would be quite a workout. Yeah. Like if he, if he dies with Cersei, he's only going to see her one more time in the books and that will be if they die together. Mm-hmm. So while I think they both die, I think that was a you know one less Benioff and Weiss original joint that we get do you think other than Bronn, the small council is what it is in the books what it was at the end of game of thrones i would imagine i mean i can't think of anyone else who would be on the small council i mean i can think of more people but i think right. those, just, i think three of the four will definitely go, yeah, it'll go on and on and on and on to think of like well it could be you know right, uh, right. may as well just write the winds of winter of ourselves if we you know if we're going to keep theorizing all that but i just wanted to touch on like the major characters and whether that fate is the one they'd share in the books so that ending montage. You know, it's funny. When I saw John when they were taking John for King's Lane to the boat, I said to myself, just let this guy keep Longclaw. Like, he deserves that. Let him keep Longclaw. Did he not keep Longclaw? And, no, he did. Okay. But he didn't see right away. He didn't see him his, when he was at King's Landing. Also, when he gets up to the north, all of a sudden he has it, you know, there it is. So I was happy he was able to keep Longclaw. Yeah. And then we see the montage, and they're all. John picks up Lorclaw, Arya, Arya picks up Needle, Sansa's getting her dress put on, and they go back and forth, back and forth, and back and forth. And this is one of the reasons why I think John's king beyond the wall is because when he was walking past the wildlings, they were all like stepping aside for him, like you would do for a king. Yeah. And then, of course, my favorite scene when you pet Ghost? When he, when he saw a ghost. I was like, that, I was going crazy. I was crying almost. Thank God. Yeah, that's probably the most... Uh, everybody was happy about that. Except for the, the Danny apologists. And then we see the last words of uh, Game of Thrones. Queen of the North. Ugh. I want to go back real quick to the Danny and John scene. With what she did, did John tell her how much she, he loves her? Like... I don't know, man. That that didn't sit well with me either. Well, they just kind of making John be like a fool almost. Yeah. Yeah. 
Like, after a while, you just can't defend that. No. I hate that they rushed it so much. I wanted to listen to our episode where we picked who would live and die and see what we got right. I think we got most of them right, dude, to be honest with you. I think I just really shot that Grey Worm lived. Yeah, Grey Worm, and Grey Worm we definitely and, got and, wrong. And, and, and Torment also. I think we both said Torment would die. Yeah, we did. Yeah, we did. Where do you think Disney's at with their uh, Star Wars trilogy? <laughs> I mean, they got to commit to something, but... Dude, that petition people started, it, it got news in, like, the Washington Post. It's no joke. I mean, it's just stupid. I mean, the, no, I mean, the thing that... It's never going to happen, redo, but... Yeah, like, it's just stupid. Yeah. I don't know, man. That's... It's rough. Yeah, he, they're stuck between a rock and a hard place. No, it's like... <laughs> it's like it's like they chose Ryan Johnson, and Ryan Johnson's like Cersei, and they said, oh, God, we have to replace her with someone else. We're going to replace her with our new Danny, D&D, yeah. Danny. And they realized, oh, crap, D&D are worse than Ryan Johnson. That's what I'm trying to figure out. Like, I feel like the Game of Thrones fan base is angrier than the Star Wars fan base. Because, you know, say what you will about The Last Jedi. I don't like a lot of the choices that he made, but... It's not a bad movie, right? It's not a bad film. It's not even a bad Star Wars film. But what he chose to do with some of the characters really hurt the canon, really hurt characters that we've known our whole lives. But it's not a bad movie. Whereas D&D, I mean, the movies they have made, Troy, X-Men Origins, Wolverine, and then anything that's not adapted in Game of Thrones for the most part, has been pretty bad. So I think if I was dizzy, I might go with Ryan Johnson. Um, Because he can't can't destroy any more story, right? Because this is an all-new trilogy. This has nothing to do with the Skywalker saga. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Knowing Kathleen Kennedy, she's going to bring We're going to put her heads together. This is what's going to happen. Team are going to write it. Ryan Johnson's going to direct it. (laughs) No. I don't know if you got anything else with this episode. I'm just trying to think anything you missed. Um, again, the angst we said in the beginning, and I'm like, it just doesn't. Does it feel like an ending? Does it? Does it feel like it's just thankful at this time just to get it over with at this point? I I hate to sound like that. Yes, yeah, so do I. But there's something to that. It's a relief that it's not coming on on Sunday. Yeah. Like, it's just, it's just relief. Yeah. Like, you know, Sunday night I have to rush home and, you know, got to put it on. That nerve-wracking feeling. Although, to be fair, the, the, the anxiety was out the door after episode three. So what's next for you, man? Like, what are you, what have you been interested in? What What's, what's your thing now? I don't know. Uh, did you see the, uh, oh, God. Did you see that new Batwoman trailer? No. Oh, the TV show, right? Yeah. I heard about it. I didn't see it, though. Pretty bad? Oh, God. It is so bad. Like, there's this guy who's playing, like, pretty much like Morgan Freeman's character. You know, pretty much. You know, Batman's lost or retired. So his cousin, who's, a, you know, this girl, who his cousin, Bruce Wayne's cousin, comes into play. Okay. And uh, she's looking at the suit. And the guy's like, Hold on, don't touch that shoe. That's that's perfection. And then she goes like this. It will be when it's on a woman. Oh, boy. Oh, it's so bad. I can't. I just can't, dude. In an era of you know, just the, the political and social culture that we live in, to try and play off like a TV show called Bat Girl or Bat... What is it? It's called Bat Girl or Bat Woman? Whatever it's called. Bat Woman. Okay, okay, yeah, Batwoman. It's like negating your whole argument. And then there was another... She's like, well, I'm not going to let a man take credit for a woman's job or something like that also on the trailer. It's just so bad. How about uh, Robert Pattinson as the new Batman? Is that confirmed? <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. Wow. That's- I mean, what are they going to keep on doing with fucking Batman? After a while, it's ridiculous. Yeah, save it for a little bit, you know? 
Let Batman rest. Although with Robert Pattinson, I feel it's like, it's like a Heath Ledger casting where at first everybody's like, eh, it's stupid, but he might be good at it. I don't know. That's it. That's Game of Thrones, man. It's all over. But we'll be back uh, at some point. I mean, we'll take a little bit of time off and uh, figure out what our next step is. Obviously, any news happens with the Winds of Winter or one of these uh, prequel shows, we'll record on that. But I think we need a rest after uh, after season eight. I think in general, I think the entire world needs a break from Game of Thrones for a little bit. But we'll be back, probably change up our format a bit, talk about a lot more stuff as it relates to science fiction and fantasy television movies. And more than that, just whatever is interesting in television and movies. And we'll start doing that real soon. I'm not sure yet if we'll keep it on the same feed, if we're going to change up the name for that podcast, I mean, we probably should, but I don't want to do something where we change the name and keep it on the same feed. We'll figure that out. And we'll be back with another, the princes that were promised uh, to talk about what we're doing going forward. Either way, that's it. It's been a hell of a run. So thanks for listening. Find us on Facebook, facebook.com slash the promised princes. We're on Twitter at princess promised. The Westerosi Companion, the princes that were promised.com. You can find our podcast on every single major podcast feed and also on YouTube. I'm trying to think of something to say, like at the end of The Lord of the Rings, when Gandalf says, And so here on the shores of whatever, our fellowship comes to the end. But they didn't really say anything like that in Game of Thrones. No. no like parting. Well, again, it's almost, I mean, God, God, real quick, it's almost just like laziness. The, the, the last words are, you know, in that montage of Queen of the North. Yeah. You know, John arrives at Castle Black and he doesn't say anything. No, it, you, you barely know what's going on until you see Tormund. And then even then you're like, like, did he get sent to the Night's Watch and he's just going to not go to the Night's Watch? Or All right, so I, I guess in, uh, in the immortal final words of HBO's Game of Thrones... Queen in the North, and we'll speak with you guys soon. Bum, 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 b